Good evening and welcome to the second of MLA's Sheep Productivity and Profitability webinar series. My name is David Brown and I work with the webinar coordinators, Home Sackett. The title of tonight's webinar is Achieving Greater Than 300 Grams a Day Lamb Growth Rates from Birth to Slaughter. And the presenter is Hamish Dixon of AgriParta Consulting. We have another webinar planned for later in the month uh, and I will advise by email to all the uh, webinar program registrants and when we have the relevant details of that upcoming webinar. This control panel uh, will be at the right hand side of your screen. Use that red arrow to collapse and reinstate the control panel. You're going to be able to hear us but we can't actually hear you so please type any questions you have for the presenter this evening in the box provided and you're welcome to put any comments and uh, share the, the weather update in your area in that box now if you want. It lets me know that you know where the box is and that you can hear us um, coming through loud and clear at your end. So on to tonight's presenter, Hamish Dixon. Hamish is the Director of AgriPartner Consulting and is a farm management consultant with a particular expertise in ruminant nutrition. Uh, Hamish is unique in his independence and has 15 years in the ag industry and will provide a practical approach on increasing prime land growth rates backed by a strong theoretical knowledge. So to talk to us about how to crack 300 grams a day and better from lamb birth to slaughter, I'd like to introduce Hamish. Hamish, can you hear us there? Yeah, I can. Yep, thanks for that, Tavo. No worries. You're welcome to um, take it from here. Alrighty, not a worry. So that should be <clears throat> all up and running now. So you can see that screen. Yep, coming through. Okay, okay your end? Yep, I can see it. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, look. Very good. Look, thanks everyone, I guess, for joining us tonight and um, and to have a chat around really achieving, I guess, 300 grams a day or, or achieving better growth rates than what we are. The seeded problem behind all of this is really looking at are we seeing the genetic potential of a lot of lambs that we've got available to us now. Um, the interesting thing from my point of view is, is it's an area that we're obviously constantly working with clients on in terms of trying to improve growth rates in lambs. Um, <clears throat> But when you look back through a lot of the trial work from many years ago, and even when we go back into the 70s, there's plenty of trials where we actually have lambs that are genetically capable and did achieve well over 300 grams a day already. So one of the big questions that I have and one of the issues that we have in the industry is that quite often we're still actually only achieving, you know, two, three, maybe 400 grams a day at best. And that may be only at particular times of the year under particular pasture conditions or feeding conditions. So to me, the real problem that we have that we need to address is how are we actually going to achieve a lot better growth rates because we have the genetic potential under these animals to do better. For all of this time, since the 70s, we've been breeding and breeding and improving our genetics within the animals that we have at the moment to grow faster rates, but we're not seeing it expressed. Even when I go back to university days and study days and even heck, biology in high school, you learn that how an animal looks and performs is driven by two things. One is the genetics and one is the environment. And we know that we have the genetics under these lambs to do a lot better than 300 grams a day. So it comes down to this environment factor and that is a whole lot of range of different effects. It's not just looking at things like weather, but there is a large effect in terms of productivity of animals. The reason that I have environment selected as a larger proportion of that animal is that it is often the biggest driver of growth rate in animals. Genetics is sure a very important aspect, but environment which makes up these things like weather, but health, the season, how we manage those animals, what's the pasture that they're on, their age, there's a whole range of factors that drive the expression of the genetics of those animals. And that's one of the really key things that we need to be focusing on. It's not to say that we let genetics go by any stretch at all, but the, how we manage the animals and how we get that genetic expression is really one of our biggest issues that we need to deal with 
if we want to achieve much, much higher growth rates in animals. Tonight, what we're obviously going to be focusing on is talking around pastures and the nutrition components that drive that, that land growth rate. So to look into that, obviously we have to start by really getting a very good understanding of what are the nutritional requirements of animals? What are the nutritional requirements of these lambs that we're dealing with? One of the things, so one of the aspects of nutrition that gets a lot of time and focus in the industry is energy. Okay, Many of you may have gone through things like lifetime new management courses. Energy is your biggest factor that's focused on in those. And certainly it's a massive component of getting growth rates right and getting them higher. We have to make sure that animals have adequate energy levels. And energy is a really important component of nutrition in terms of fat deposition. So if we have lambs and ewes that have insufficient energy coming into the system, you will naturally have lambs that are actually going to be leaner. So often we see that growth rate and sometimes subsequent um, carcass specs, if they are too, too light on, on a fat component, then energy is one of the big things we want to be looking at. Now, energy isn't the only aspect of nutrition that we have to think about when we're dealing with the nutrition of lambs and trying to achieve high growth rates. We have to think about other components such as protein. So what are the protein requirements of these animals? And is that being met by the feed, whether we're just dealing with a pasture or a pasture with supplements as well? Um, because if that protein requirement isn't being met as well, then we have a handbrake on that growth rate. We simply will not achieve the genetic capacity of that animal. And protein's a big driver of muscle growth. So naturally, if we limit that, we aren't going to achieve the carcass weight to achieve the growth rates that we want at the end of the day. One of the other really important parts of nutrition once we start digging into it is actually looking at dry matter intake, which is simply how much feed those animals are eating. And when you look at the nutrient requirement tables of animals, whether we're talking about lambs or mature stock, there are generally three main components to what's on there. One is the dry matter intake. How much do they want to eat? How much do they need to eat? And then the protein and the energy requirements. So how much they can consume is a very important part of dealing with the nutrition of these lambs to make sure that they can actually achieve good genetic growth or good growth rates. So there are limitations sometimes as to how much feed an animal can eat. Just because we have a paddock with 1,500, 2,000 kilos of feed available per hectare doesn't always necessarily mean that they can consume as much as they want. There are sometimes limitations, things like high fibre content, might be very high moisture content. So if we have pastures that are sometimes as low as 10% dry matter, so 90% water, a small lamb with a fairly small rumen size often may not be able to achieve and consume as much pasture as we would say that they need to meet their high growth potential because they're simply having to eat too much wet feed to get it in. So there are factors that will affect how much feed an animal can consume, or how much pasture an animal can consume. And if they can't meet their requirements, then we need to be conscious of that and actually manage that nutrition differently if we want to achieve the highest growth rate that that animal can, can achieve. NDF is neutral detergent fibre and is one particular measure of fibre that we use as an indication of intake potential. So the higher that NDF figure goes and its percentage, so zero to 100, the higher that NDF figure goes, the less of a particular feed they'll be able to eat. And we can use that number quite clearly when we're actually looking at um, the intake levels that animals want. Now, there are equations that are available to help you get some guidance as to how much of a particular feed an animal will be able to eat of it based off its NDF. And the equation is basically 120 over the NDF. So let's say for argument's sake, a feed is 30% NDF, 120 over 30 gives us four. So we know that animal could eat at the very most 4% of its live weight. So for young growing lambs, we know that we need feeds that are down around that 30% NDF mark for them to consume high levels of that feed. If all of a sudden that NDF starts to rise up to 60 and we have 120 over 60, which is 2%, gives us 2%, we know that they won't eat any more than 2% of their live weight of that feed. And at 2% intake, that's maintenance. So there are, there are ways of actually very objectively assessing pasture quality and understanding 
what limitation it may have nutritionally in terms of achieving high growth rates in lambs. The other aspect when we start looking at nutrition is obviously that we have changing pasture quality. So we need to be conscious of that when we're trying to align what are the requirements of our lambs that we're trying to maximise growth rates in? How do we align that to pasture quality? And yes, it will change. It's not something that we can look at one month and then assume it's going to be the same for the next two months because pasture quality changed rapidly and we're all seeing that, especially at this time of year. One of the things that's actually very interesting to look at is how quickly that quality declines as soon as those plants typically start to get towards flowering stage. Now, obviously this profile, this change in quality will change a little bit depending on the pasture type, whether we're talking about pastures that have a lot more summer activity or loosens compared to grasses. But the broad principles in terms of how this quality changes over time is quite sound. And one of the things that's actually re very interesting to look at is when we're looking at trying to achieve maximum growth rates in lambs, realistically, we want diets that are at least 11, 11 and a half ME. So that starts to push us right up to this very top section of this, of this curve. And it starts to show us why quite often we may not be achieving the growth rates that we think we should be on what can sometimes appear to be quite good quality pastures. In many instances, what we look at as a green pasture is often already falling below requirements for maximum growth rates of lambs. One of the other aspects that we need to be conscious of is the balance in terms of energy and protein as well. So when we have pastures that are very high in quality, they're very high in energy, quite often the protein content is actually quite high at the same time. And in many cases we're, we're sitting at 28% or more. You know, we have some pasture tests that will come back in at 30, 35, and I've seen one at 40% protein. Now, even for younger weaner lambs, if we're looking at even you know, a high requirement of 16 to 17%, we're still well over the protein requirements of those animals. So there is a cost in terms of that excess protein being ingested and having to be processed and excreted. So one of the other components that comes into play when we're trying to manage nutrition of lambs on pastures and trying to get the maximum growth rates is balancing all of the components of nutrition. So in some situations, what would actually suit best with many of our very high quality pastures where we have high energy, but also excessively high protein is to put in something like a cereal grain and something like oats in many cases, which is high in energy, but low in protein and can help balance that overall diet for lambs. So there are different components in nutrition that we have to manage all at the same time to try and get the nutritional requirements of lambs met by whatever pastures and whatever feeds we have available to them. Um, a couple of those pictures on the, on the right hand side of the screen there just give us some images of different feed types and, and obviously the top one our, our clover ryegrass type pastures are typically you know our gold standard in, in many cases for, for what lambs will be growing out on and certainly their capacity for, for achieving high growth rates is, is certainly there. The middle one there is actually a Phalaris versus fescue scenario. And there's no fence line in that, that's simply preferential grazing. So one of the other things that we do need to be conscious of is palatability of feed. You know, how attractive to stock find different pasture options that we have available in front of them. Because that is one major thing that will limit intake and then subsequently limit energy and protein consumption and growth rate. The bottom one there is actually an oats with some vetch underneath as well there, it's probably a little bit difficult to see, but that type of feed is the other option that's open to many places when we're looking at, at later season feed too. One of the things that we've been discussing now is, is actually looking at, well, yes, that's gone up and the quality at, this, at that point where the photo is now is probably reasonable, okay? We're probably looking at something that's sitting around that nine and a half ME and sitting at probably somewhere around 10 to 12% protein. One of the things that changes when we're looking at say standing crops, which are certainly getting used more and more in the last five years, is that as that crop ripens, obviously our quality components change a lot. The leaf and the stem material quality continues to decline, but we're actually achieving some good 
quality feed from the grain that's ripening in the head as well. So we have to balance that out as an entire feed resource and, and think of it in its entirety and figure out whether there's actually much um, supplementation that's required to balance that and, and achieve good growth rates. But when we're thinking about really how those different feeds fit over the course of the year and how do we achieve high growth rates from birth all the way through to sale, it's no use having a red hot pasture that's only going, going to meet the needs of those lambs for one or two months. We have to have good quality feed available until those lambs are ready for sale. Now we can look at time of lambing and a lot of other issues like that in terms of how we can um, you know, maximise the turn off time and maximise the utilisation of the pastures that we have on, on the farm. But we also need to be conscious of ensuring that we have a good mix of feeds or suitable feed over the course of the year that actually meet the requirements of our use, of our breeding use, and also our sale, our finishing lambs. There are lots of resources that are available to us in the industry that map out things like when we can expect to have good quality growth from different pasture types at different times of the year. And resources like this table that you see on the screen at the moment are a great way of being able to map out what are some of the different pasture types that will provide quality feed when I need it given my time and calendar of operations. So depending on where you are, there will be a range of resources. There are generally industry resources that are, that are available at a, at a national level, but many of us also have lots of local trials that have been run that map out things like what are the pasture growth rates at different times and hopefully some aspects around quality as well if they've done some pasture testing. But these sorts of tables, like I say, are a great way of actually looking at, okay, we are potentially lambing in May, or we might be July. Whatever your timing is, how are we actually gonna put some feed resources in place to make sure that we have high quality pasture? How do we have pasture that's actually at this upper end of the curve in this active growth phase at the times that I need it when we've got lambs that are being turned off and growing out? And, and that's the main way that we can actually look to achieve um, high growth rates for as long as possible. Because pastures are by far our cheapest feed resource that we have available. So we wanna try and maximise the use of those as much as we possibly can. Supplementation is certainly an important aspect of managing nutrition of lambs and achieving high growth rates. But wherever possible, we wanna try and set up the pasture base to do as much of that leg work as we possibly can. When we're looking at the supplementation side of things, one of the first steps we wanna look at is finding out or determining exactly what our pasture quality is at any one point in time. Okay, and one of the simplest ways of doing this is to actually get a feed test conducted. Okay, so that's relatively simple just to get a feed test done on some pastures and it's not something that you necessarily have to be doing every week or every couple of weeks to be monitoring pasture flat out but you will actually think about one or two key times throughout the year that it's valuable to have a very good understanding of what the quality of the feed is. So often if we're thinking about weaners, okay, a great time to get a pasture test is of one or two weaning paddocks. And you might collect that test a fortnight before weaning's going to occur. So you've had time for those samples to be sent off, to get the results back, and to make some very good decisions about how you're going to manage the nutrition of those lambs to maximise their growth rates from weaning onwards. Okay, hopefully their growth rates from, from birth to weaning have been very high and a lot of that legwork has been done by the ewe. So that's been a big focus, or should have been a big focus in terms of managing the, the nutrition of the ewe prior to that. But pasture tests are, are a very important aspect of actually really clearly understanding pasture nutritive value. And if we look at how that changes over time, if we take an example of something like a lucerne even, we tend to find that obviously quality declines quite rapidly, especially for something like energy in lucerne. Okay, so in that early vegetative growth phase, we will see that the energy is up at about 11.1. We're getting higher protein figures from lucerne, which is probably no surprise to any of us, but the energy content starts to fall away quite quickly with lucerne. And if we take that example in terms of working through a scenario of how do we actually determine what the management practice is going to be to maximise growth, 
we need to firstly understand those figures. So if we take something like Lucen at a mid-growth phase, okay, so we're talking about potentially Lucen that might be um, in say six weeks time, six or eight weeks time. If we assume we've sent off the test, it's come back, we know it's 9.8 ME, so that's the energy content of it. It's 18% protein, so that's the CP. We've got the NDF figure, which is our neutral detergent fibre, and we know that it's 35% dry matter. If we look at our lamb requirements, the dry matter intake requirement, we've looked at our table, we know how much these, these lambs are looking for. They're a 30 kilo um, lamb that's coming through and we say they, they need 4% of intake. So they're looking for 1.2 kilos of feed on a dry matter basis. Now this is where we start to use things like this neutral detergent fibre figure because we can't always just assume that those lambs will eat as much as they want. Especially as pastures mature, their fibre content increases and that can limit how much an animal will consume of it. And in this case, if the NDF is 37%, we know that that animal will only be able to eat 3.2% of its live weight, no more. Okay, so it's looking for 4%, but it can't eat that much. So if that's how much it's consuming, which, which equates to just under a kilo of dry matter per head per day, at the energy and the protein content of that feed, we know that it's going to be short, 3.7 megajoules of energy a day, and it's just going to be a fraction short on the protein front, not much, 17 grams is, is fairly minor. So when we know that, and this is simply a number crunching exercise, but it's very, very important in terms of being able to work through are we going to achieve the genetic potential of these lambs for growth or not? In this scenario, many, many times, I guess we see that we've got lambs on loose and we think they should be doing fairly well. It looks like a fairly good quality pasture, but when you actually truly understand the quality that's available to animals, you start to see why they're not performing as well as they should be. And Lucent is a very, very classic situation for this. And often we see that we put lambs into a loosened paddock and they don't quite perform as well as we, sh as we think they should. And I guess the point that I'd like to make also is that a lot of what we're talking about is achieving maximum growth rates. A lot of these little decisions and a lot of this management and a lot of this understanding around nutrition and pasture quality is about maximising growth rates. It's not to say that lambs are going to drop dead tomorrow if we don't do all of this or even that they won't grow. But if we want to have lambs that are doing three, four, 450, 500 grams a day, we have to be actually managing their nutrition a lot better than we currently are. So in this situation where we have predominantly an energy deficiency, we start to think about what type of feed is going to balance that. And as we alluded to earlier, a cereal grain fits the bill in this type of scenario because it's high in energy and relatively low in protein. So a touch over 300 grams a day of something like oats or barley would fix that energy deficit as well as the protein and actually balance the feed very well. From a cost point of view, we did a break even on this and even at five bucks a kilo for carcass weight, we're looking at having to improve growth rates by about 38 grams per head per day. Okay, so if they're doing 200, Currently without feed and they do 238 grams with the feed, we broke even on the feeding cost. In practice, what that decision would realistically do is normally improve growth rates by anywhere from sort of 60 to 100 grams per head per day, depending on your, on your genetics. So these little decisions are actually often very, very worthwhile. The other important things, I guess, that come into play when we're looking at improving growth rates and one of the reasons why we wanted to discuss this tonight is that it does have a big impact on overall profitability because the quicker we can turn those animals off and the more efficiently we can turn them off, not only have we actually improved stock condition, we've freed up pasture that may be available for more use or to run use in better conditions. And often running this sort of system and, and being aware that this sort of strategy is going to be in play year in, year out, then it allows us to really maximise the efficiency of the whole operation. So a lot of what we've been talking about is the, the very particular components of managing nutrition on different pasture types. 
But certainly how we manage those lambs all the way from when they're in utero to sale can affect the growth rates. So there are some general things that we do need to be aware of to try and maximise those, those growth rates as well. One is thinking about how do we manage them before weeding, so making sure that they have been imprint fed on grain. Okay, If we're going to be feeding grain to those animals at some point later in life, it is very much worthwhile getting them accustomed to it before they're weaned off. Okay, Not only will it allow them to get onto that grain much more quickly when they're older, but there is work that shows that starch, the addition of starch in the diet to pre-weaned animals can improve room and development. Now that's one of the things to be careful of is that the most effect or the biggest effect that you'll get out of this is generally when those lambs are still quite young. If you can bring that into play while lambs are still six to eight weeks of age, you'll get a very good effect. If you're trying to do that when lambs are 20 weeks of age, you get very little effect. Weaning age, weaning weights, managing the health of those animals are all aspects that will actually determine to some extent how quickly those lambs can grow in life as well. You know, and that pre-weaning management, how we've actually looked after the use, how well they've milked, is a critical aspect of actually managing post-weaning growth rates as well. The heavier we can get those lambs at weaning, the much the better they will do post-weaning. You know, bigger lambs have slightly lower requirements per kilo of live weight. They tend to handle lower quality feeds slightly better than light ones. And some of the benchmarks that we're really looking at trying to achieve in terms of weaning weights are on the screen in terms of merinos and crossbreds. And it's determined by what the adult weight is of your ewe. So if you take a, a dry ewe in score three and she's say 60 kilos, for merinos we're trying to get our average weaning weight up to 27 kilograms. And for crossies, we're trying to get it up to 33. So that gives you your benchmarks to actually try and achieve. And if we're not hitting that, then that should be a bit of a driver to be able to, to be looking at the ewe performance, their milk production, um, and potentially also looking at the pasture quality, particularly in that later stages of, um, or, or probably in that age window for the lambs of that eight weeks plus mark when they're starting to transition to taking in more paddock feed, um, they certainly have a very high requirement for quality feed to keep those growth rates right up. So the weight targets are, are something to keep in mind. Um, differential management is one thing to be aware of as well in terms of actually managing lambs and their weight groups. Okay, If we have a big spread in terms of the weight of weaners, then it's very difficult to manage the feeding of those animals accurately partly because it's difficult to determine their requirements clearly if we have you know say a 15 kilo weight range across those animals it's far better to split them into tighter weight ranges partly so we can manage the nutrition more closely more closely and cost effectively but also so we actually minimize a lot of that dominance that we tend to get where we have big lambs in the same area as small ones and that's an issue not just in aspects like feedlotting, but it is an issue out in the paddock at times as well, especially when we're heavily supplementary feeding at times. Um, the final thing that, that, that I will just touch on before we start to, to rip into some questions is um, look, yard weaning has been something that's been in play in the cattle industry for a long time now. Um, over the last few years, it's certainly been getting a lot more uh, exposure and use in the sheep industry. And we are finding that there are some benefits associated with that. So it's something to keep on the radar to be thinking about down the track. Um, it tends to certainly reduce stress in those lambs later in life, just as it's been proven to do in cattle. Um, some producers are using it as a way of actually uh, getting stock a lot more used to yards, getting them used to respecting fences, if you've got somewhere that you can um, wean them into with, with very good fences. Um, and the other aspect is if you are looking at doing any feedlotting for particular groups of animals, then that yard weaning exercise will actually bring them into that scenario in a much better condition and they'll handle that induction time far better. Um, and one of the other things on that feedlotting point is, is just to make sure that when we're looking at achieving high growth rates in a feedlot, just as we are in, on pastures, we have to get that nutrition right and we have to have the right animals in there. Okay, one of the last things we want to do is to have the tail of the lambs that haven't performed on pasture thrown into a feedlot where they haven't actually got much genetic capacity for growth either, and we put them into one of the highest cost feeding systems we can. So just a, a bit of a side note there. Um, Dave, I think that takes us up to our half hour or so, so happy to 
to have a chat about any questions that, that might come in. Thank you, Hamish. Thank you very much for a very concise and informative webinar. And thank you for all our uh, participants this evening. Now, uh, just to give Hamish a break there for five minutes. Um, you're welcome to continue on with the uh, question time tonight. Now, Hamish has agreed kindly to stay online as long as we need to answer any questions that you may have for him there. Now, don't forget to use the questions box on your control panel there to log your questions in. Um, try and be a pretty clear and concise with your questions so we don't have to interpret it too much. And um, if there's any sort of comments that you'd like to make, then you're more than welcome to drop them in there for to add a bit of context. Now, you're also welcome to uh, disappear for the evening. I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate Hamish number one for finishing the webinar in good time. And I appreciate everyone for sticking around to the end here. I, I can see that all the attendees are still with us. If you do decide to duck off now, please take a moment when you log out of the webinar to complete the post-webinar survey. And we'll make sure that if there's any uh, critical feedback that we take notice and, and make, uh, make moves to keep improving the webinar service as we, um, as we continue throughout the year. So Hamish, yeah, there's some good questions coming through here. Um, I might even take the lead on one if I may. Sure thing. Yeah, so Hamish, I, I noticed there was, uh, you know, in your presentation about your focus on NDF, neutral detergent fibre. Now, I suppose as a as being a fave with a lifetime new management, we talk a lot about digestibility. Um, you know, and I've often, I've often thought of digestibility as an indicator of intake as well. Do they talk to, do they talk to the same issues or should I be taking more notice of NDF? Uh, look, if, if you are purely interested in intake potential, then NDF is a far more accurate measure of that. Um, digestibility is what I call an interesting figure. Effectively, it just tells us what percentage of feed is utilised versus what percentage goes out the back end. Um, in terms of actually formulating diets, it's not of much use on its own. Um, when we look at the requirement tables of animals, as I said, they're published in terms of looking at how much, in terms of total kilograms of feed, do we want to provide to that animal broadly? And how much energy, how many megajoules of energy per day and how many grams of protein per day does that animal require? And in a lot of respects, digestibility doesn't come into play into that sort of scenario. So digestibility is a figure that has, um, I guess, been around for, for a long time. And we have some guide or guidelines, I guess, available within the industry that, that give us some information about what type of digestibility figures are appropriate for achieving different growth rates. Um, of feed, but it's 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 certainly a more rudimentary measure of that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Hamish. Hamish, a question here from Wayne. Uh, Wayne asks, is it not the case that NDF that if NDF is low, uh, then ME or metabolizable energy will be low as well? Commonly, yeah. Commonly, that that, that alignment is there. So typically, you tend to find that as NDF falls, the energy will will be high as well. Um, the the exact balance between that is is not a straight line correlation, and, and it varies a little bit depending on the pasture, or or you even see that in things like grains as well. So, yeah, commonly that that trend is there, but it's 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 not um, a perfect relationship by any stretch. And and the other thing I guess to to make comment on there as well is that. Um, Yes, we want a lower NDF in terms of driving intake, um, but at the very low end of that spectrum as well, we do need to be conscious about the risk of things like acidosis. So one of the reasons that um, uh, grains can present an, a, a grain poisoning and acidosis issue is they have a very low NDF figure. And things like wheat, which are our highest risk for acidosis, have the lowest NDF. Now it's the starch within that wheat that's causing acidosis, but the very low fibre content is what can allow animals to, to eat three, four kilos of some grains if they really want to plough into it, um, whereas there'd be no way that they'd achieve that on 
on on pastures or hay that, that has a higher NDF as well. So so typically at the bottom end, you know, we, we don't want to see diets overall that are under 30%. Yeah, spot on, thank you. Um, uh, just another note for the participants who are asking questions tonight. Um, if you want to, if you're going to talk to the issues of pastures, it's sometimes a good idea to drop your location in. Uh, so when I ask the question, hey, she he's got a rough idea of where you're coming from and, and what any of the regional factors he may need to consider are. Uh, Hamish, another question here from, from Max. Max asks, do you think we need to move away from monocultures such as lucerne to better align feed requirements? Should we be looking at pastures with over eight species in them? Um, there's two questions within that. One is, do we need to be still looking at monocultures? And certainly if we were purely looking at it from the animal's point of view, then there are no pastures available at this moment that will provide us a long feeding window of high quality feed on their own. Um, so in some respects, sure, you know, monocultures present problems. Um, and in many monocultures, especially if we're looking at things like cereals, um, have their own particular nutritional issues. And that's why um, combinations can, can work very well. Um, the other aspect of that is 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 simply animal performance and, and their satisfaction of being able to select different feeds. Animals get bored on single feeds for long periods of time. You know, their intake eventually is affected and you see it often in merinos more so. Um, whether we need to be pushing to things like eight combinations, um, I probably don't think we need to go that far, but certainly having some mix of feed available to animals I think is is worthwhile. Right, yeah, thank you. Amy's hey, question from Neil. Neil asks, does the input uh, imprint feeding have to be the grain that the lambs are going on to post weaning, or are they going to adapt to whatever grain they are fed after they're taking away from the ewes? They tend to adapt to, to any grain afterwards, so it doesn't have to be the same grain at all. Um, probably in practice, I do find that if you are feeding, say, something like beans that are a, a larger grain, then if lambs haven't been exposed to beans and they've, say, been exposed to, um, you know, just barley or oats prior, then it does still take them, um, you know, a few days to, to get the hang of it. Um, so if it was something like that, then yeah, in the perfect world, you would you would imprint feed them on on beans. But for for most of the other grains, um, the the speed at which they'll get back onto those 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 grains, even if it is a slightly different um, species or variety, is is minimal. Okay, thank you, Hamish. Hamish, there's, a, there's about four questions here from all different participants, but they're all related to your comments around yard weaning of sheep. Now, I know you didn't pay particular, or you know, uh, flesh it out a lot. Uh, these questions are asking yep. you too, and I'll just run you through them because I, I suspect you'll be able to sort of answer them in a wrap. Um, you know, uh, Colin asked, what do you consider the best practice for pro uh, yard weaning process for lambs? Um, and just to bear with me, how long, you know, how long do you suggest for yard weaning, um, the size of yard, lamb density, um, you know, and how long, you know, yeah, and how long would you actually yard wean for? So do you have any of the detail around those aspects? Yep. Um, look, I'll start off by saying that um, certainly it's been done less in, in sheep than cattle. So there are, you know, still, there's still room for fine tuning the details of how it's done in sheep. Um, I think I'm sure that MLA a couple of years ago did um, a PDS on this with some producers in Victoria, if I'm correct. Um, we may be able to, to circulate some information on that. But, but broadly speaking, look, what we're looking at is, is basically getting lambs into um, a contained area. Now, they don't need to be at a feedlot type density. Um, but if we have them in an area where we have, say, even 10 to 15 square metres per head, that's that's reasonable amount of room for them. Slightly more room than that is, is not a big problem at all either. Um, mobs, we want to try and keep to, you know, at least 
no, oh, sorry, no, no more than 400 in a mob if we can. Um, what's more important is access to feed in that type of scenario, just as it is in the, in the feedlot scenario. We're basically trying to replicate a system where we've got them contained, we're managing all of their feeding, and during that time, and, and on the time factor, we're looking at trying to, to contain them for probably a week to 10 days. Um, sometimes we'll see people get going up to, up to two weeks. Whether we're getting much benefit out of that time, don't know. Um, certainly, probably the cattle side of things, where we're looking at trying to get that week in as well. So that's the, the the time frame that we're working on at this point. During that time, it's about trying to get the handling into place. So you know, walk amongst them. If it's nearby your yards, run them through the yards a couple of times. Um, it's about trying to get them used to handling, get them used to you, get them used to bikes or whatever else are around, so that when they do come through the yards, there's less stress. When they're handled later in life, there's less stress. Um, they're used to things like feeders. They're used to um, um, different types of feed. So one of the one of the challenges is actually still providing good quality feed while they're in that system, and good quality feed that will that you can introduce them to quickly. So you can't go out there with a whole whack of barley or wheat. Um, you've got to give them you know very high quality hay, preferably with very small amounts of grain trailed out if you can. Um, uh, that's kind of the, the crux of it, I think. Was there any other particular questions in those that I haven't hit on, David? No, I think I think you've covered most of it there, Hamish. But like you said, there's obviously uh, some existing material on that. So if people want to research um, the MLA-based work on the yard of sheep, then they're more than welcome to, to go ahead and do that. Uh, Hamish? Yeah, probably the only other thing I'll just, just add is is water quality is really important okay if you're locking up weaner lambs um, make sure they've got really good quality water make sure you're cleaning it regularly so that that's not impacted their water intake isn't impacted right and a good question here from david and one that i was actually um, anchoring to ask as well you showed a photo uh, where it looked like there'd been a fence run down the middle of a paddock, but there wasn't. It was just that there was fescue and phalaris uh, on either side of the picture. Uh, which one yep. was actually the long and rank one, or which one was which? So fescue was the long and rank one. Phalaris was the one on the right, which had been preferentially grazed. Okay. Right, yeah. yeah. And, 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 that's, and, and that is fairly reflective of fescue. Fescue takes um, very good grazing management to maintain quality. And as soon as it starts to get up, the quality declines quickly. And if there's anything else, stock will chase everything else first. Yeah, right, yeah. So, so fescue needs probably pretty heavy grazing to keep on top of it, does it? Yeah, yep, it does. And, and that's where your grazing management affects quality and, and we're not just talking about fescue in that sort of situation. It's um, keeping keeping feeds, keeping pastures in that short active growth phase is really important in terms of maximising quality and, and yes, particularly in something like fescue, um, that's that's really critical um, or else you simply look at other other options as well. Yeah. Just to, um, just to uh, add a bit more context, I, I thought, Hamish, that Fescue also had a slightly different maturity pattern to Phalaris, and if that paddock maybe uh, maybe the fescue was maturing earlier than the Phalaris and had sort of run ahead a lot earlier, and the ones that lambs or sheep have been put in there, is that is that possible? Is that from true to your experience? Yeah, yep. So so that there is a different maturity pattern there. Um, I guess in, in terms of that particular um, paddock, it, it, it was. It had basically had been all the same height previously, um, and it had just developed that way with with selection. Um, not all in the one grazing, I'll add, but yeah, certainly the, the different maturity pattern will affect palatability and and how stock want to graze that. So if it has an earlier maturity pattern and it is simply running up to flowering to head, the quality is going to decline. And if there's something better on offer, um, sheep or cattle will will certainly always select that first. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Hamish. It was a pretty striking picture, so yeah, interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. Quick question here from John. Hamish, is there a role for buffers or rumen modifiers for grain feeding with lick feeders 
on loosened pastures? Um, yes, it depends very much on the grain that you're using, and I guess you'll you will have noticed that I that I spoke about oats predominantly in those situations, and and I certainly realised that the availability of oats and sometimes the price of oats is is prohibitive, but um, it is often in those situations by far the best choice um, if you're looking at it from the just nutrition point of view. Um, so different grains have different acidosis risks dependent on their starch content. And as we move up the, the ranking in terms of grains that are a higher acidosis risk, then the role of things like buffers come into play. Um, so if we're looking at feeding things like barley or triticale or wheat, um, or even on the legume front, something like peas, which tends to have um, slightly higher starch content, then buffers can be an important part of, of managing acidosis. Um, a lot of it, particularly on something like barley, and if we are feeding barley at relatively low rates, where we're talking about that two, 300 grams a day mark, then if we get stock onto that rate of, of barley um, gradually, and they're adapted and they're adjusted to that grain, in theory, there's no requirement for a buffer, especially at that level. Um, where buffers come into play is, is when things go wrong and when the intake of grain varies a lot. So that might be that we've had um, feeders or if we're using lick feeders um, that we, we haven't got the adjustment on spot on and all of a sudden it's, it's open a bit more than we thought and they've, they've hooked in. Um, or if we've had some poor weather for a couple of days and grain intake started to fall off and then we get a nice fine day, well, the next thing that happens is those stock will really hook into the feeders and, and once again, the risk of acidosis in that sort of circumstance is pretty high. Um, or we've had a worker who, who hasn't refilled the feeders for a couple of days and then, and then just stocks it back up again without adjusting it. In those circumstances, buffers are worth their weight in gold. If you could ensure the lamb's got 300 grams a day every day that you're feeding them, it wouldn't be needed. Awesome. awesome. Thank you very much for that. Now, a quick question here from Tanya. Hamish, the importance of colostrum quality and quantity from use on short-term and long-term land growth rate. Yeah, um, a lot of the colostrum research was done quite a few years ago now. There's been a bit of a resurgence in some areas on it. Um, a lot of the, the colostrum work, which was showing a higher quality colostrum and higher quantities of colostrum, was driven through some corn research or, or feeding of corn out of WA. Um, and, and it was certainly showing, showing much, much better quality colostrum. The long-term impact in terms of looking at growth rates, you know, say two, three months down the track, I haven't seen any trial work on that really demonstrating a, 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 a big benefit. Um, but I'd be, um, I'm happy to have a quick dig and after the, the webinar, if we, we find some really good stuff on that, then I'll, I'll let you know. But I haven't seen anything um, looking at a, at a long-term impact on that. Certainly there's good evidence in terms of um, uh, the, the growth of lambs up to weaning time. There's some good trial data there showing that, that those improvements are there partly in, in performance in terms of growth, but partly also there would be, you know, an immunity um, performance improvement as well, which is a bit hard to quantify um, other than, than trying to put some numbers around things like mortality or, or disease, but um, certainly that's there. But these days, a lot of what happens is, is people are, are looking at trying to use even just barley um, as that pre lambing supplement to try and boost colostrum production. How effective that is directly in comparison to corn, I don't know, but a lot of that's really just being driven by the assumption that the corn has high starch, barley contains starch as well, albeit at a slightly lower concentration. So it, it, it presumably is helping to some degree. Um, the, the other aspect too is, is simply that um, looking after the condition of use throughout that pregnancy and particularly late pregnancy stage is, is going to maximise colostrum production, is going to maximise milk production as well um, and really look after lambs up to the point of weaning and set them up for good growth post weaning too. And there's, there's lots of really good evidence around um, the importance of nutrition throughout pregnancy in terms of affecting things like muscle cell formation and muscle development in pregnancy and, and its effect on, 
on the the, the growth rates of lambs, um, you know, once they've been born. Thank you, Hamish. Uh, Hamish, a question on your uh, one of your opening slides. Uh, Scott asks, why was there such a high growth rate in 1974? Again, referring to yeah, the, look, uh, yeah, lamb growth rate. Yeah. That was uh, just a bit of a selection of some different um, trials that, that were done, you know, over the years, and, and there's a bit of a mix of crossbred and merinos throughout that. So, um, sorry, I should have probably explained that that better at the start. There, it, it wasn't necessarily a, an average for the year as such, but it's it's a selection of trials that really just are there to demonstrate that um, it's not as though you know we couldn't achieve 300 grams a day, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, we were, and and you know, in many situations, we're still um, pushing to try and do that now. And that's despite the fact that we have um, been putting so much selection and genetic pressure on trying to improve growth. So assuming that's been happening, there should be very good genetic potential under a lot of the animals that we have. And 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 I'm not questioning that because in in some instances we've got a um, we've got a basically a research feedlot plot in New South Wales where we, we have um, some very good facilities in terms of being able to measure daily feed intake of individual animals and daily live weight of animals as they feed. And, and there are animals within those situations that can comfortably do 600, 700 grams a day. Um, and at, at, at particular points during that feeding period, you know, they will do 800 grams a day. So genetics are there. Um, it's, it's about getting it to express consistently. Thanks, Hamish. Hamish. A question from Jim here. Why do lambs or even the ewes placed on good quality loosened pastures preferentially graze the grasses which may be on the peripheral areas of the paddock? <laughs> yeah, they will. Um, they love to do that, especially, you know, young lambs. Part of it is is familiarity, especially with, with lambs that haven't been on loosened before. You'll see that virtually every time they'll they'll go around and clean up every bit of grass on the fence line first and and like I say some of that is simply familiarity and and it's no different to to what you see with animals having to get accustomed to grains having getting accustomed accustomed to um, using feeders as well so some of it is that um, some of it is is quality and you will find if you have stock that have been on loosen before so the familiarity issue is is not present then sometimes the quality can affect intake as well um, you'll find things like nitrate content of pastures will vary and and loosen can accumulate nitrates to a small degree and if the grasses are lower which they commonly are then stock will naturally find they're more palatable so they'll they'll go for those first um, once they're out of the picture then they'll they'll go back on to on to loosen after that, um, and and you'll find that also stock are reasonably good at actually balancing their intake if they have options for feed as well. So you may have a paddock with some great looking loosen in there. If you also have some grass in there at the same time they will naturally find a bit of a balance between the loosen and the grass intake and, and if you actually monitor the growth rates, you'll find that they actually probably do better as well. And you see that quite often where we have paddocks where someone's sprayed out the grasses. Um, often the growth rates aren't quite as good in those paddocks as where they have a little bit of um, opportunity to select other feed. Awesome. Thanks, Hamish. Hamish, a question from Chris here. Uh, any, any, uh, any need for supplements like Molybdenum, my uh, pronunciation is not great, Molybdenum, <laughs> Molly yeah, Denim. Tough one. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, look, we haven't even touched on the mineral front and to some point that's a very deliberate move. Um, when we talk about nutrition, I guess it's, it's very easy to slip into, uh, I guess, putting a focus on putting out minerals, you know, in the form of blocks or licks or even vitamins as well. Um, I guess the reality is is that if there is a severe deficiency of, of minerals and, and you know Molly may be one of them, then sure they will limit growth of lambs and it's important to, to manage that. In many, many situations, in 95% of situations, the biggest gain that we will get in terms of trying to pick up growth rates is dealing with energy and protein first. Um, that's where the biggest gains are. Unfortunately, 
they often take a bit more effort to to manage. Um, it's not as easy as as just throwing out some blocks. Unfortunately, it means that there may be um, either you know different considerations around what pastures go in, or if we're looking at supplementary feeding, it's it's more work to be going out with the grain cart. But the reality is the biggest gains in terms of picking up growth rates are dealing with the biggest components of nutrition, which are energy and protein. Um, things like molly, if, if it is limiting pasture growth, we need to be conscious of it. But the other side is that we have to be very aware of its impact on livestock production too. So often when we're looking at minerals, we, we may be considering them in terms of their impact on pasture production. And that's valid because the whole point of you know growing the most pasture is to is to run the most number of stock and, and maximise profit. But with something like molly, if you go way over the top with molly, then it will lock up copper availability in in, in um, well it will lock up copper availability to animals. So in some circumstances where the livestock consideration hasn't been thought about, then we've actually ended up with situations where yes we've we've boosted pasture production a bit. But we've actually then induced a big mineral deficiency, which is impacted on, you know, reproductive rates or animal health. So it needs to be balanced, um, and and certainly, um, you know, that there are some some fairly stock standard mineral supplements that, that we need to be thinking about. You know, things like making sure we have calcium supplemented on on, you know, grazing cereals and grazing cereal stubbles. Um, those sorts of commonplace ones are, are certainly worth putting into play. Um, the need for a lot of trace minerals varies, unfortunately, across regions and across properties. A lot of the old mineral maps that showed particular regions of Australia were, were deficient in cobalt or selenium or copper or whatever else um, can can very very broadly still be true. But what we have done over the years is we've changed our fertilizer recommendations. You know, not many places just have the stock standard whole region approach to fertiliser, you know, we're, we're, we're pinpointing it, we're changing it paddock to paddock, let alone um, property to property. We're liming different areas which then changes soil pH which releases different nutrients. So it means that um, if we actually want to get mineral nutrition correct, we need to understand well, what is the situation on the property in terms of deficiencies or not. Um, and in, in virtually every situation, um, where, where we actually do some looking into mineral profiles on properties, a blanket broad spectrum mineral premix in the form of a block or a leak is not warranted. There may well be one or two minerals that, that are worthwhile addressing and, and like I said, where there is a deficiency that needs to be managed, it, it is important to do that. But the, the very broad spectrum minerals, often there may be 60, 70, 80% of that which is actually not required by the animal anyway. So it just gets excreted. Great, thanks Hamish. Hamish, question here from um, from Libby. Uh, Libby asks, does creep feeding with oats pay? When would you suggest to start creep feeding with oats? Um, I guess in terms of whether it pays, look, it's, it's not specific to oats or not, creep feeding in principle will pay provided that it's actually balancing the feed that they have available to them. So part of providing some supplementary grain is is getting them used to that grain, so that imprint feeding. Now that doesn't need to be there, you know, every day of the week for, for three weeks, you know, two or three feeds and, and you've ticked that off. In terms of the creep feeding of, of allowing access to, to basically lambs only, um, due while they're still on, on their mother. Um, it, it will pay where pasture quality isn't sufficient to meet the requirements of those lambs on its own. Um, so if you find that um, the pasture quality is starting to decline, so if you think back to where we had um, that graph of pasture stage and where it's starting to sit in terms of things like energy and protein. If we're starting to come off that top where we have really high quality pasture still, then certainly having um, a creep feeder available with, with oats or, um, or a different grain which suits the requirements of those animals will certainly pay. Um, 
whether it's oats or something else depends on what the requirements of those lambs are at that point in time. So if the pasture quality is really falling away and we know that protein is limiting, you might come in with something like lupins in that feeder instead or a combination of oats and lupins. Um, but yeah, in principle, if, if, if you are ensuring that, that the requirements of those animals are met, then I would suggest that in my situation that's going to pay. One of the one of the really important things to be thinking about when we're looking at supplementation is that the maintenance requirements of animals, or if you think about requirements of animals, they have a have a core need for energy and protein to meet maintenance. So just the basic physiology requirements of that animal. And then we have a requirement on top of that for a lot of our production aspects. So it might be wool production, it might be growth. Um, so often what happens when we start to have feed quality declining is we still have this base maintenance requirement that has to be met and that's virtually can be considered like an overhead it's an overhead cost to your livestock enterprise and one of the reasons that small levels of supplementation to complement feed um, is often very very cost effective is that for small levels of supplementation often we kick ourselves well above that overhead cost or we get ourselves out of that overhead again and that proportion of feed is genu generally going straight towards our production, going straight towards growth or wool, so, so the return is good. Um, so that's the main principle to be thinking about in terms of costs, benefits of that. Um, you never ever want to be having to heavily supplementary feed purely to make up quality, you know, short of drought conditions or something like that. If, if you're having to supplementary feed in a big way just to make up quantity of feed, um, so I'm not sure I said quality before. It should be quantity. If we're only trying to make up a quantity shortfall, we're in trouble. You know, we've got to look back at stocking rate and things like that. But if we're just supplementary feeding to deal with quality, um, then it, it can pay very well. Okay, Hamish, thank you. Uh, so we've got a, got a few questions yet to go. Um, some of them may have already been answered to some extent, so we'll make that call when we get there. But a question here from Tanya. Uh, management of excess potassium on lush green pastures required to achieve 4% um, uh, dry matter intake and subsequent scouring, importance of mineral supplementation, I think you may have covered that, uh, but focusing on magnesium in particular and also calcium. But the first part of the question was about excess potassium on lush green pastures when achieving that 4% dry matter intake. Yeah, yep. So you you will find certainly, and, and you know, you've hit the nail on the head there, certainly with lush green pastures, and, and it applies generally um, to things like our grazing cereals and 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 also um, things like our grass and, and, and clover pastures as well. So it's not just limited to cereals. It's where it often gets a lot of the airplay is, is saying you need to put out magnesium and, and calcium supplements whenever you're just on cereals. But the potassium issue is is quite often there on on short rapidly or not short but rapidly growing pastures so it needs to be considered um, one of the reasons it's a bigger issue on um, things like your cereals is that you then overlay a calcium problem and, and it's um, a, a bigger issue in terms of metabolic diseases but on pastures it, it is still worthwhile addressing um, so that potassium as you've alluded to limits magnesium availability within the rumen um, if we limit magnesium availability, then we can impact on um, not only growth, but also calcium metabolism a little bit as well. So it, it, it is worth looking at. Basically, one of the things you can do is you can see how high we are for potassium. And that's you know another thing that you can do when you're actually doing feed tests is, is just get the potassium done at the same time. And if it's well over 2%, then we know that we're in the territory of having to deal with um, trying to supplement some, some magnesium. Um, the old Cosmag mixes, so um, the general recommendation even on cereals is, is two parts Cosmag, two part lime, one part salt. Um, that still stands up quite well in terms of actually being effective in, in addressing that magnesium deficiency side of things. Um, the palatability of it can be questionable. And I guess in my experience, I find some mobs of sheep will, will consume it easily, you know, that they don't have any dramas at all. Other mobs sometimes will be a bit reluctant too. In that situation, you tend to end up having to push back onto a more commercial type blend, which might have, you know, a bit of molasses powder mixed through it or, um, you know, some 
some oils or whatever else in there, some meal, something to make it a bit more palatable as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's certainly worth considering, and in a lot of pasture situations, it is one of the things to to address. But I will say that still, um, it's it, it, looking after that on its own is not going to necessarily drive intake up massively and deal with any issues around energy and protein on its own. Okay, thank you, Hamish. Hamish. Cool. Now, I have a quick question here from Colin. Colin asks uh, if there's any adjustments needed to the weaning weight, uh, i.e. percentage of ewe weight, uh, targets for lambs weaned as twins. Um, look, you can give it a little bit of consideration, but I guess when I look at weaning weights of of many twin wobs by the time we've got to weaning and if we're talking about say um, looking at a, at a point in time of say 14 weeks after the start of lambing then where the ewes have been looked after and they're in good condition therefore the lambs have been born well they've been growing well off milk production a mum and the quality of the pasture is high all the way up to weaning then Twin lamb weaning weights generally shouldn't be very far behind, if at all, um, many of the singles. They will tend to catch up reasonably well in that later stage. Um, so, sure, you know, look, th th there is some consideration given there that, that they may be a touch behind, but if they're a long way, then I'd suggest we need to look back a little bit earlier about what's been going on management-wise as well around, around the nutrition of those twin lambs too. Some of that may actually have even stemmed to um, nutrition of the ewe while she's pregnant as well, if, the, if they are far lighter at weaning. Oh, yeah, thank you, Hamish. Hamish, um, question here from Brad. Brad asks, uh, if lambs have been born and raised on self-feeders, is it safe to say that you can just wean them onto a full self-feeder feedlot? Um, if, if you know with reasonable certainty that they have all been accessing the feeders and they've all been consuming high amounts of grain out of the feeders pre-weaning, then you are fairly safe to put them onto a, a feeder um, post-weaning. There is always the risk, however, that there will be some lambs in that group that may not have been consuming much or any grain at all. So that's why I say you need to be confident that all of the lambs are accessing feeders. And the other big part of that is what else is going on at weaning time. Because effectively those lambs would have to come out of the paddock where they've been on feeders and straight, virtually straight back into, you know, into a containment or feedlot area onto, onto feeders then. If they have, you know, a day of being mucked around and they're off feed and they're off grain, then you need to probably just be a little bit careful about getting them back on again. Um, you don't have to take them back to nothing, but they, you, you'd just be a bit wary of that. Um, the interesting thing is is how quickly animals can lose some adaptation to grain. And if you have lambs that have been off grain for two days, you're virtually back to square one in terms of getting them back onto that onto that starch and, and dealing with that acidosis risk again. That's very interesting. Thanks, Hamish. I, didn't, I never would have guessed that it, their tolerance to grain disappeared so quickly. Um, yeah, it's something that, you know, and I'm sorry, I'll just make one quick point is that if you're, it's not to say that if you are trail feeding that you can't do every two days because what happens in reality is that there's still grain there in the paddock that they're picking up, you know, in the days after you've been trail feeding. But if you just all of a sudden stop access to grain, um, and, you know, two days later, all of a sudden, you give them access to a kilo of grain, then there will be problems. Right, yeah, thank you. Hamish, uh, David, another David here on the webinar, he's provided some context to the uh, tall fescue. Um, I'll just read it out, just for comment's sake, um, and to give you a break for a second. David said that the issue with the tall fescue depends on whether it's a summer active or summer dormant fescue. He goes on to clarify that summer active fescues are great when the summer rain with summer rain 
once heading in the spring has finished. So yeah, thanks for that, David. Really good. Now, um, yeah. a question here: Do you have any supplementary feed suggestions that fit with a grain-free pasture-fed lamb programs? Um, sorry, you just cut out for a second on me at this end, but I think it was just around supplementation for the pasture-fed side of things. Yeah, yes, um, grain-free. Yep, for grain-free. Um, look, it, it becomes more difficult. Certainly, you end up having to rely a lot more on um, really high-quality, you know, hays or silages. Um, to push right away from um, grains means that you're dealing with, well, if you look at your grains, for example, the efficiency there is that we're dealing with something that might be, you know, anywhere from 12 to 13, 13 and a half ME, okay, per kilogram of feed. So, that, so that's quite high. It's very high. Um, if you compare that to, to many of our hays, if we're looking at, say, average quality cereal hay, all of a sudden we've dropped back down to something which might be eight and a half, nine ME. It might be 10, 10.2 if it's top quality cereal hay, but it's often a bit difficult to produce that. Um, silages start to come into play a little bit more in terms of, of, of a feed that can um, come closer to meeting the specs of a, of a grain, um, but it's they're still not as high. So the feeding rate of, of those other feeds is generally going to be higher. Um, the cost efficiency may not be quite there. But um, bottom line is, if, if, you, if you have a fit for that pasture-fed system in your enterprise, then realistically you're probably looking at something like, um, you know, either a silage that has some legume content in it for feeding during um, drier months from sort of late spring onwards, you know, where we don't have summer active pastures or fodder crops available to us, so we're trying to balance dry feed. Um, and, and, and on the other hand, then you might be looking at, at something like trying to, trying to source a very high quality cereal hay to, to complement a little bit of winter feed, but it's, it's not going to have as high effect as, as what you could do with grain. Um, and yeah, certainly with the, um, the pasture fed cattle side of things, there's a little bit more opportunity in terms of legume um, byproducts and grains to, to come into play there. Certainly cereals are off the table but um, there's a little bit more opportunity on the cattle front. Thank you, Hamish. Hamish, can you comment on the need to balance fibre in the diet on brassicas by sowing with millet? Um, keep in mind the lower ME. Yep, so certainly the, the fibre side of things with, with brassicas can be a problem, you know, when they're in that very short growth phase and, and sheep are very good at selecting leaf material off brassicas and, and that's the lowest fibre part of the whole plant. Um, and in terms of managing the grazing of it, we want them to hammer it down anyway and to really take that, that part of the feed because that's what will regenerate the quickest and give us good opportunity. Um, but yes, the low fibre can present a problem in terms of of some scouring in, in stock. Um, sometimes it pays just to be, just to think about how much of a problem it is. If, if we're certain it's not worms and it is just a feed related scouring, sometimes it's not the end of the world. Um, provided we're, we're managing things like flies and it's not gonna ping us in terms of, um, you know, dirty lambs going to slaughter and whatever else. One of the reasons that, that we're getting that little bit of scouring is, is we are driving intake to a high level and, and it's the moisture content going through. Now, at the very bottom end of things, we don't want to get to the point where it's actually um, causing us some problems with acidosis because the fibre is, is far too low, which it, which it can go to that point. But it, it, is, it does pay just to consider whether there's a real need to supplement or not. Balancing with something like millet, um, I think, is certainly an opportunity to, to go into, into those systems. Um, it, it, it can work quite well, partly from, as, as you've identified, the fibre point of view, but even from actually balancing feed a little bit and giving them some variety. Um, you see it even with, with some cereals coming into play. And yes, the cereals obviously mature at different rates and they're at a different stage, but um, that they can actually provide some complement as well. So a lot of that's driven down to what's actually gonna grow you the most bulk out of those those companion species. 
Um, and, and part of it also is actually, well, are you better off just putting some hay out there? Um, they, one of the common things I always get back is, oh, but they're not really eating much of it, so is it worth doing it? But they, we don't want them to eat much either. And, and in a lot of respects, we just want them to have a small pick at it. Um, so it's not a problem if they're, if they're not really eating very much at all either. We just want a tiny bit just to bump up the fibre. Um, sometimes things like a bit of bentonite can slow down that passage rate a little bit too. Um, but equally, there's a, there's a high end there where we don't want them consuming big amounts of it either and, and actually affecting um, you know, nutritional intake. But a small amount can, can be beneficial. Great. Thanks, Hamish. Hamish, I think it might be the last question, actually. So you're definitely on the home run and you've done a great job to this point. Um, That's all right. And this here is a pretty uh, pretty probing question from Ross. Uh, well done, Ross, for asking a, uh, a star question at the end here. Is it true, Hamish, that with the recommended lime and cause bag uh, and salt mix on cereals, it is actually poorly absorbed in the rumen because it is in an inorganic form. Short answer is yes. The the bioavailability, which is what they one of their measures of that, of a lot of your inorganic um, minerals is relatively low. But that is why the feeding amounts and the feeding recommendations in terms of how much animals should receive are relatively high when you compare them to, say, alternative minerals like your organics or chelated types. Um, so, so certainly, yes, there is a level of, of that mineral intake which, um, or an amount of that which is which is not absorbed very well at all, and some of it is passed through, and you find that with a lot of a lot of mineral supplements. Um, at the end of the day, there's often a discussion around which is the the better way to go and certainly our organic mineral supplement products have been around for a for a very long time but one of the reasons I guess they haven't found a lot of traction is simply down to cost benefit so if a product is more bioavailable and can effectively give an animal a higher level of a particular mineral that's good but at the same time if it's say 50% greater amount of that mineral getting absorbed, if it's 50% higher cost, well, you're in the same situation. But if it's triple the price, then it's questionable. So, um, yep, good question. And that's kind of the situation that we're dealing with. Awesome, thank you very much, Hamish. And that actually wraps up the last question there. And you've maintained about two thirds of the participants or the attendees to this evening's webinar right to the very end. So well done there. Now, thank you everyone for you. Uh, for attending and um, and asking such good questions. So Hamish, you're making use of his skill set while we have it available to us. Now don't forget that we do have another webinar coming up in the uh, in October. And once we have the relevant details nailed down and confirmed, we'll communicate that with you via email. Thank you very much to MLA uh, for funding tonight's webinar and making it possible. And last but not least, thank you for Hamish for pulling such a, a good presentation together. No, thank you everyone for, um, for attending, it's been a good night. Okay, well, thank you Hamish. We'll, um, we'll call it an evening and, and for everyone out there, have a good evening and, and if you do get the chance to drop some comments on the, on the uh, webinar survey when you sign out, please do so. Uh, they'll be read and, and, uh, and well considered. Okay. Good evening.